in uh, 2014, uh, my family uh, and I took a four-week trip from uh, South Australia uh, into Western Australia through to Karratha. Uh, we made our way from there north to Broome, uh, and then we turned the corner and started to head across through the Kimberleys, uh, through Fitzroy Crossing. We, we kind of turned right at Catherine and went down to Mataranka Springs uh, and then continued south through uh, Ayers, Ayers Rock, Alice Springs uh, to Cooper Pedy. Cooper Pedy's a real hole. Um, <laughs> if you've been there, you know what I mean. It's full of holes and um, as a mining town, <laughs> open mining town, and then on down through back to where we were living uh, south of Adelaide. And it was a fantastic trip. You might have heard me speak about it before. A fantastic trip. And we set out... And that same thing that happens most times, I think any of us take a trip, happened is we, is we headed out and there was a sense of excitement, but there's also that sense of I'm leaving the comfort of home because home's nice, right? And, uh, and so the day we left, we left, we'd stayed with my parents in Adelaide uh, the night before we headed out and we headed out and it was, it was July, um, July middle of the year and something strange happens in the southern states in July, it rains really heavily. I know we don't get that up here. So the kind of rain that we might get in some of our heavier downpours here in the summer was the kind of rain that we were driving out into the country in, in the dark because the sun hadn't come up, passing B-doubles on the motorway with all of their wash and wondering whether we would survive to breakfast on the first day of our trip. Thinking, well, home was comfortable. Home was nice. You know that feeling of home? And so we had a great experience. We lived together in our camper trailer. So, um, you know, just... Fold the tent over, four of us living together for four weeks, cram together as a family, together. Um, and so, you know, and the, the canvas can sometimes get hot, so as we made our way north and west and certainly into the subtropics, uh, it was, you know, quite warm. And, and so we went through all the kinds of things that happen when you drive on red dust four-wheel drive roads. Uh, that happened with a camper trailer. We went through the heat. We went through the cold. Uh, we went through frozen water in the morning, uh, frozen heads and frozen toes when we were out in the desert. Uh, we went through all of those challenges. We went through the wet. We went through the dry. And so let me tell you that as the trip went on, as much fun as it was, home started to look pretty good. You know that feeling? This is great. I'm enjoying this now, but I'll be home sometime. You know the feeling, you go on an overseas trip, you're traveling, you're enjoying it, but there's something in you that's looking to the end, going, why don't it be good at the end? You know that feeling? Being home. Yeah? Hold on to that thought. Hold on to that thought, that feeling that we carry within us, that on our journey, that we've, we, we leave a sense of, of things at the start and we kind of live with a sense of, of the thing that will happen when we get to the close of our journey of being home again, that nice feeling of anticipation, that sense of longing. Hold on to that this morning. So this weekend we bring our Jesus Is message series to a close. And in doing so, I I, want to have a look in some sense at the immensity of Jesus, the, the magnitude of Jesus as we journey through this last message in this series. Have you enjoyed this series? Yeah, I have too. It's been great. One of the most profound things that we read about Jesus in the ancient historical texts of the Bible is found in the account of Jesus' life given by one of his closest followers, John. And in John chapter 1, he begins with this insight. In the beginning was the Word. Notice the Word has a capital W, like it's a title or a name, or a noun. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him, all things were made. Without Him, nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. And then John goes on a few verses later to explain who this Word is. In in chapter 14, he says this, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So clearly what John is saying is that the Word of God is a person and that person is Jesus. Jesus is the Word of God. Ah, you're thinking, 
That's what Adam's message is today. Jesus is the Word of God, and you would be wrong. No, that's not what today is about. Although it's an important thing to remember, what we're seeing here. But that's not the main thrust of what I want to share with you today. For our focus today, what the disciple John is saying is that the Word of God is Jesus, and that Jesus was there at the beginning of all things. And that through Jesus, all things were created. Through Jesus, all things began. Now, the writer of Hebrews validates this insight in the opening line of his writing in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2. He says this, And now in these final days, He, that's God the Father, has spoken to us through His Son. God promised everything to the Son as an inheritance. And through the Son, He created the universe. The universe was created through Jesus. He was there at the start of it all. So let's get some more perspective and and kind of marry these two thoughts together a little bit. Let's look at the narrative of creation found in the ancient text of Genesis. So if we're going to look at the start, let's go to the start and have a look at Genesis. Genesis 1, 1 to 26. We're not going to read uh, every verse, but let's see if you can pick up a little trend that goes on in here. So verses 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So there's not much going on. Then verse 3, and God said, let there be light. Verse 6, and God said, let there be an expanse between the waters to separate, blah, blah, blah. And verse 9, and God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and dry ground appear. Thank goodness for that. Um, Verse 11, then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants, etc. Verse 14, and God said, let the lights in the sky, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky, so we have night and day, etc. Verse 20, and God said, let the water teem with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth, etc., etc. Verse 24, and God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, especially cattle. Thankful for that, if you like a good steak. Verse 26, then God said, sorry, vegans, Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, etc., etc. Do you get the picture here? God opens his mouth to speak all of creation into being. God opens his mouth. And I'm not getting into the exacting nature of how the creation unfolded, just that he opened his mouth and spoke creation into being. So, what happened if, if Jesus is the word is that when God opened his mouth to speak all of creation into being, out of his mouth came Jesus. In the creation of all things, Jesus was what was spoken in a sense. That Jesus, in a sense, is the utterance of God the Father's will, in a sense, if he is the word of God. So through Jesus, everything that is was created. Everything that is came into being. Everything began with him. My friends, Jesus is the beginning. Jesus is the beginning. The beginning of all things came through Jesus. All creation, all matter, all people, you and me, God opened his mouth and spoke your name and through Jesus you came into existence. Sure, your mother and your father had a hand to play in that. But Jesus is the word that spoke you into existence. Look at it like this. Jesus' DNA or Jesus' sculptor's fingerprints are all over you. You don't need a Jesus tattoo on your body. Very cool if you have one, that's fine. But you don't need one because you're already marked as being made through Jesus. You are a living, walking testimony of the creative reality or the fact that Jesus is the beginning, made in the image of God. Jesus is the beginning. Jesus is your beginning. But wait, there's more. The same John who tells us that Jesus is the word of God went on in the latter years of his life after the death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ to heaven to have this amazing Holy Spirit-inspired apocalyptic vision of history and of the future, and we find this in the book we call Revelation, right at the end of the Bible. At chapter 1, 
Uh, in chapter 1, at the opening of this amazing revelation vision, John is encountering Jesus. And from verse 12, we read these words. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. This is, this is John in his vision. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. Now, just as an aside, seven golden lampstands. In the book of Revelation, the lampstands represent the church. And the number seven in the Hebrew culture was the number for perfection or wholeness or completeness. And so when, when John is seeing seven lampstands, what he's seeing is an image of the entire church present with Jesus. And among the lampstands, now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read out this description for you, much like those of you who are old enough to remember Sale of the Century, a who am I question. A little bit of a clue, and when you know who it is, you just call it out and you can be the winner. And among the lampstand was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars, seven complete stars, all of creation. The entire universe held in this being's hand. And out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the shining the sun shining in all of its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and he said, first of all, who am I? Well done, being winners. <laughs> this is an image of Jesus. This is Jesus that John is seeing. Then he put his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, the living one, I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Friends, this is Jesus that John is encountering in this vision. This glimpse, this revelation of Jesus tells us that Jesus is no small God. Small G God. He's no small G God. He's no metaphor. He's not a concept. He's not comfortable. He's not fathomable. Jesus presents in this profound way. His eyes are like fire as they gaze on us. His countenance reflecting the purity of his holiness. His feet strong and steadfast like bronze. And his voice like the sound of a raging river or a majestic waterfall. And my friends, when we think about who Jesus is in light of what we see there, fear and awe are appropriate responses from us. Jesus wasn't another good lad. Oh, good bloke, that Jesus. No, no. Good blokes don't have eyes blazing with fire as they gaze upon you in their holiness and majesty. This is so significant for us to understand as followers of Jesus, or if you're considering becoming a follower of Jesus. It means that before everything we see and know around us throughout history, Jesus was before it. We've said Jesus was the beginning. But we also see here that Jesus is the first and the last. So Jesus is the beginning and the end. Jesus is the beginning of all things, and Jesus is the end of all things. So Jesus was before all things, but it also means if he's the end, that after all the turmoil and challenge of our war-filled global reality, Jesus will still be there. He is the first and the last. In the Greek, the words are the Alpha and the Omega, beginning and end. And so beyond all of life's ups and downs, Jesus stands. He's the end. In verse 18, Jesus told John that he holds the keys to death and Hades. He's the one in control of that. There's nothing that Jesus has not or cannot overcome. And because of this reality, we can live with hope and with perspective and with power. Because Jesus is the beginning and he's the end. In the 2012 British comedy movie, The Best Exotic Marigold Hotel, some of you have seen it. If you haven't, you should. It's a movie about this group of retirees in England who uh, discover that they're not able to fund retirement in England because of the economic climate, but they are enticed to move to India where their money goes much further 
uh, by the advertisement of this young hotel owner called Sonny, who's advertising the best exotic uh, Marigold Hotel as a place to live out your retirement days. And so we see in that movie, the owner of this hotel has something to say in response to what these people who come to live with him discover that the hotel is not all it was cracked up to be and that the, the brochure was a little more glossy than the hotel is. And he simply says this, everything will be okay in the end. Everything will be all right in the end. If everything's not all right, then it cannot be the end. He's reflecting the words of John Lennon. Everything will be all right in the end. If it's not okay, it can't be the end. My friends, there's something of that that's, that's true for us as believers, as those of us who follow Jesus, that Jesus is the one who makes everything all right in the end because he is the beginning and he is the end. He holds the keys to death and Hades. He sits sovereignly over all of that. So if we find ourselves in a circumstance where we're going, everything's not okay, well, that's okay, it's not the end. Because in the end, little spoiler for you, if you haven't quite read to the end, Jesus wins. And therefore, those of us in relationship with him share in that victory, can live in that victory. Everything will be all right in the end. If everything's not all right, then it cannot be the end. You know, I know in my own life, through some of the ups and downs, uh, life has been challenging. Uh, some of you uh, will know that um, uh, a number of years ago now, I had the, the not-so-fun experience of burnout. Uh, that wasn't great. Um, I've had all kinds of ups and downs like many of you have had. Challenges with finances over the years, challenges with uh, circumstances and relationships, all the kinds of things that we go through. To be honest, the last few months for me, in life in the broader context of our movement that we're a part of has been times like a roller coaster for me that have had moments of despair for me in my privateness, in the quietness of my own heart and mind, where I've just gone, where's this all going? But this truth and this reality gives me hope and a sense of purpose and a sense of power because Jesus is the beginning and Jesus is the end of all things. Revelation gives us this beautiful revelation of Jesus. He's the first and the last, the beginning and the end, and in the end, Jesus wins. So this, friends, is why we should make Jesus the middle too. The everyday reality of our life, the air we breathe from moment to moment. You know, the same John who had this Holy Spirit-inspired apocalyptic vision of Jesus also recorded Jesus during his three years of ministry on earth uh, and recorded Jesus making this claim in John 14, verse 6. Some of you might be familiar with this. Let me read it to you. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Well-known 16th century theologian John Calvin, he has a commentary on this verse. Now, I'm not uh, I'm not spruiking Calvinism, for those of you who know what that is, and I'm not saying I'm a Calvinist, for those of you. And don't stone me for those of you that think I should be. Um, for those of you who care about what that means, I'm um, probably a Calvinian somewhere in there. You know? And if you don't know what that means, ask me later, and I'll try not to explain it clearly, because it's very difficult. But John Calvin had this to say about Jesus' claim, that I am the way, the truth, and the life. The way, the truth, and the life... He, that's Jesus, lays down three decrees as if he had said that he is the beginning and the middle and the end. And hence it follows that we ought to begin with him, to continue in him and to end with him. Let me go on beyond what you see on the screen. We certainly ought not to seek for higher wisdom than that which leads to eternal life. And he, that's Jesus, testifies that this life is to be found in him. Now, the method of obtaining life is to become new creatures. He, again, Jesus, declares that we ought not to seek that life anywhere else. And at the same time, Jesus reminds us that he is the way by which alone we can arrive at that life. 
that he may not fail us in any respect, he stretches out the hand to those who are going astray and stoops so low as to guide sucking infants. Presenting himself as a leader, he does not leave his people in the middle of the course, but makes them partakers of the truth. At length, he makes them enjoy the fruit of it, which is the most excellent, delightful thing that can be imagined. Now, if some of that has confused you, let me explain it. In other words, Jesus here is telling us that he is the beginning, the middle, and the end of our salvation. And it's not just that we can't turn anywhere else, but by the mercy of God, we don't need to turn anywhere else because he is the one who gives us life. And yet, as the one who gives us life, he doesn't set us on our way as the beginning and say, well, I got you here, well done, off you go, and I'll catch you at the end. He doesn't do that. He journeys with us between the beginning and the end, and that, Calvin says, and that, Jesus says, is the most delightful thing to be experienced in life. Jesus in the middle of our lives. Derek Rishmay clarifies Calvin's thoughts for us in this way. He says, When it comes to gaining the life that's truly life, there's no way around or above or away from Jesus. He himself is the source of that life. We don't start by Jesus and do the rest ourselves or move on to something deeper to get to life. No, at every step of the way, it is Jesus moving us along. He is the one who recreates us, brings us to participate in the truth that leads to life and guides us by the hand to that life that we would not be able to find in our own strength. We should make Jesus the middle two. We should make Jesus the substance of our everyday comings and goings, moment by moment, breathing him in, breathing him out, not holding him at the edges, at the peripherals of our life and our vision and our comings and goings each day, but actually drawing him to be the focus at the center of what we do. And particularly men, I'm stereotyping, but it's stereotypically true. We need to move to greater intimacy with Jesus. We need to get, I know we don't like singing songs like, I want to touch your face, Jesus sounds creepy. I don't want to touch his face. That's not very manly. I don't want Jesus to be my boyfriend. I get that, men. But we actually need to grow in intimacy with Jesus. And while I'm stereotyping, and this is not an absolute truth, but it would seem to me that that our, um, our female counterparts seem to find that easier in their general makeup. But all of us need to draw to a place where we are more intimate with Jesus in the everyday comings and goings. One priest, a couple of centuries ago, talked about how he would practice the presence of Christ in the everyday moments of life. We should make Jesus the middle too. Because Jesus is the beginning and the end, he's able to be our friend. Jesus is grace for you and me today. Jesus is the point of all creation and therefore the point of our lives, the meaning and the purpose that we hold. Jesus is joy, the source of hope and satisfaction in our lives. Jesus is here because he conquered sin and death and he holds the keys to death and Hades. He is here and he's alive and we can abide with him and we can know him and we can relate with him and he doesn't have to be distant, he can be close and the very fact of his, um, his uh, reality of his, who he is means we don't need another mediator to have a relationship with God. You and I can go directly to God. So making, the Jesus, making Jesus in the middle means to find our life in his. This is not the same as making a little room in your life for Jesus. You know, we often say that, would you like to invite Jesus into your life? It's the wrong question. The real question is, would you be prepared to find your life in his and let go of the rule of your own life? Would you be willing to do that? Don't get get me wrong, I think Jesus takes whatever we give, to be honest. But what we were meant for is to make him the middle, where we find our life in his life. Surrendered, abandoned, 
to Jesus. It is trusting yourself completely to the one who holds all authority on heaven and on earth because he's the beginning and the end. And this is the truth. Jesus told us clearly that all authority on heaven and on earth had been given to him. So how strange does it seem that we can often become so focused on the establishing of our own personal authority in relationships, in communities, in our jobs, in the workplace and in ministries. When all the authority for those of us who follow Christ is really his and we only but steward it and hopefully in a way that brings him honour and glory. Do you know, so often... I know I can take back the surrender of my life. Do you know what that's like? Maybe you can identify. You might be even be able to look back to a time where you said, Jesus, everything for you, my whole life for you, I'm abandoning myself to you. But if you're honest, you look back and go, but I'm just taking this back today. I'm just having that bit because I don't like that that's not going the way I want, so I want control of that. I'm taking that back and I'm taking this back. And sure enough, after enough time, you realise I am so stressed and tired because I am trying to control everything. And yet Jesus is the beginning and the end and he's the one who desires to be in the middle and being in the middle with Jesus is the most delightful thing that life can bring. That's where life is at. My friends, this morning, if you've taken elements of your life back to try and control and rule, could I encourage you this morning to release them again? Your time, your resources, your energy, your relationships, your career, your ministry. Release them to Jesus. It's the beginning and the end. You're not. But he is. We should make Jesus the middle too. Now, I started this morning with drawing us to that feeling of anticipating home. You remember that feeling? You're away from home, you're traveling, and you know home is going to be there. And that feeling of everything will be okay, we'll be at home, and home is comfortable. In the end, everything will be great, even though right now, Things are a little bit uncomfortable. You know, we got home from that four-week trip and we discovered a couple of things. First of all, the house that we went back to at the beach in Goolwa in South Australia was huge. It seemed huge because we'd been crammed together into this camper trailer for four weeks. And our, our house just seemed to be far more than we possibly needed. But more importantly, my reflection was this, that when I arrived home, expecting that feeling of, oh, we're home there's comfort, there's relaxation, there's peace, there's perspective. I discovered, in fact, that I had had home with me the whole time. Because home was where my family was and my community was, and that was by far the most important thing. And I could have missed out on that home if I hadn't thought it through and taken the time to be in the middle of that trip with them. And the same is true for us in the Christian life. We live in anticipation of the end, but that doesn't mean that we have to wait for the end for, for the delight of life that we're exposed to experience in the middle, which is an intimate relationship with Jesus. My friends, Jesus is the beginning and the end, so we should make him the middle too. Let's pray. Maybe the team can come and join me. You know, this morning as we enter into this attitude of prayer, I really do want to give you an opportunity to choose afresh this morning to find your life in Jesus' life. To find a place of surrender To see Jesus as the one who brought you into being, or through whom you were brought into being, purposed you, planned you, and who will be the end of all things, to choose to make him the middle today. In particular, in this moment, for those of you who've been walking with Jesus for a while, and this morning you've just realized afresh that. distance there that you don't really want. 
And it's like any relation with any human being. It needs to be invested in. It needs time. It needs focus. It needs priority. This morning you're wanting to choose afresh to let go of the areas of control that stress you, drain you, cause you anxiety even perhaps, and to release it to Jesus and to acknowledge his authority as the one who holds the keys to death and hate. So has all authority to trust him a little more today. Maybe you're here this morning and you're a bloke and you're just going, well, I, I, I'm not even sure I do friendship well. I've got mates, but we're not close. I don't know how to do this with Jesus. Just to say, Jesus, I want to find my life in you this morning. Would you show me how to draw closer to you? Lord Jesus, thank you that you are the beginning of the end. Lord, we want to breathe you in this morning in a fresh way. We want to know you more. Lord, we want you to be our middle here at Real Life Christian Church. The focus at the forefront of, of all that we are. While in this attitude of prayer, if, if this is something that you're identifying with, of wanting a greater sense of, of abandoning your life, of surrendering your life, of letting go afresh to Jesus. That maybe I'd like to open up your hands, palm up in front of you. It's a little gesture of surrender as we pray. Lord, here we are. Lord, we're sorry for the times when we just go through the motions of Christian life, Sometimes religious life. We're sorry for the times when we thought we could do it better than you could. We're sorry for the times where we've held you at arm's length. Lord, we thank you that you're so gracious and you're so loving that when you began us, you began us to know you more. And then you did everything that was needed for us to know you completely. So we can look forward to an eternity with you. So Lord, we ask you afresh to lead us into making you the middle day by day, this week and in the weeks to come moment by moment, a growing awareness of your love and your presence and your relationship with us. Lord, we surrender afresh. Lord, we do this as a church together, but Lord, for those for whom it's relevant this morning, we do it as individuals. So good, Jesus, and we love you. This morning, we want to run into your arms. We want to declare that forever you reign, We know the riches of your love will always be enough. And nothing compares to your embrace. Lord, we don't, want, don't just want to sing it. We want it to be the attitude of our heart this morning. It carries us into our week. We invite you to lead us on that journey now. In your name, Jesus, we pray.